And this whole world is like a star at dawn, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, an echo or a rainbow, a dance, a dream. What happened to your childhood? Terrible, beautiful, whatever it was. Hey baby, it's back with the pyramids and the dinosaurs. It's back into the void and a new day appears. As Maya Angelou says, it's a wonderful day. I've never seen this one before. It keeps coming back. Hey there, and welcome back to Heart Wisdom, Jack Hornfield's podcast on the Be Here Now Network. I'm Ganesh, honored to welcome you to episode 233, Wisdom is Playful. This is a freshie, hot off the press from February's Monday Night Dharma Talk for Spirit Rock. And in here, Jack is back, fresh from Costa Rica, a rather harrowing adventure, which he shares briefly on. But amidst that, he brings quite a cosmic attitude to the Dharma talk, spelunking the depths of the mystery while keeping things light and playful. Despite diving into all the great changes that were all undergoing, including his own aging and his colleagues' aging, Jack graciously offers the salve of the loving awareness of Ram Das, the one who knows perspective of his teacher Ajahn Chah, and the truth and compassion of his great friend and colleague Stephen Levine. In this episode, Jack notes that wisdom is playful and that wisdom is gracious. And I invite you to sit with that and take that with you to contemplate how wisdom has been gracious to you in your life, and also to use as a barometer for if you're taking in knowledge or wisdom. Wisdom, Jack states, is inherently playful. But before playtime, we do have some housekeeping. April 15th starts the Living Beautifully course Transformative Science and Mindfulness Practices to Cultivate a Wise Heart. This is a course that Jack is doing with Dr. Dan Siegel, the incredible scientist, award-winning educator, and New York Times best-selling author. This course will be a sweet and flowing dharmic ping-pong match between Jack and Dan's wisdom, and it is the first of its kind, so I highly suggest you go to jackhornfield.com or the link in the show notes here on the podcast to sign up for Living Beautifully. Then on May 20th, the next session of The Power of Awareness starts. This is a seven-week online mindfulness training with Jack Hornfield, Tara Brock, Conda Mason, and Devin Berry. This is one of the premier mindfulness trainings in the world and a truly wonderful offering. And then also on May 20th, we have the Spirit Rock Monday Night Dharma Talk and Meditation. This is the guru bead on the mala for staying in touch with Jack's teachings throughout the year. Spirit Rock does these every Monday. Jack zooms in once a month. And this episode is actually plucked from the recent February Spirit Rock Monday Night Dharma Talk. So if you enjoy this, I highly implore you to head over to jackcornfield.com and sign up for the next Monday Night Dharma Talk. So there we go. Let's get into this amazing episode. Thank you so much, as always, for joining. I truly hope this episode helps you meet the wisdom in your life in a playful and gracious manner as we spelunk this wonderful and mystical existence. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May your heart be smiling, and may you help others through the authenticity of your being. Namaste. I've recently returned from travel teaching in Costa Rica, and I was there with my beloved Trudy, 
who got quite sick. She'd actually had an infection in California and it got much worse there, and ended up being hospitalized. And now she's a lot better. And it feels really good to be back home in our own place, in our own bed. And it's mysterious, you know, getting on an airplane, those metal tubes with a kind of thin, you know, aluminum wall. And there we are at 38,000 feet. And all of a sudden you're in a different continent. It's extraordinary. And then I come back and look at this culture after having been away for a month or a month and a half, kind of make sense of the way people move here, which is different than what was true in Costa Rica. Who are we? Who are you that gets to travel in this really miraculous way? There's an even bigger mystery beside airplanes, <clears throat> global travel. Who are we? We get lost in our phones, you know how that happens, and our to-do lists. But what about if you look up at the night sky? What about if you look at the mystery of a single tree or flower? The mystery is amazing because it's us that's amazing. We are beings of spirit, we are beings of consciousness. Spirit came into your body to be born in this incarnation and it will leave it when you die. Mary Oliver writes, the spirit likes to dress up like this, 10 fingers, 10 toes, shoulders and all the rest. It could float of course, but would rather plumb rough matter an airy and shapeless thing. It needs the metaphor of the body. So consciousness comes into this human body. And as Thich Nhat Hanh says, this body is not me. I am life without boundaries. I've never been born and I've never died. Since before death and before time, I've been free. Birth and death are only doors through which we pass, sacred thresholds. Birth and death are a game of hide and seek. Pretending we're separate, that we're not connected, that we're not the field of life itself, expressing itself in some new unique way in your incarnation. Oh, nobly born, begin the Buddhist text. Remember who you really are the sons and daughters of the awakened ones of the great lineage of those who've awakened. And look around at this mystery. Rachel Carlson, the great environmentalist said, if I had influence with the good fairy who's supposed to preside over the birth of all children, I should ask her gift to each child in the world be a sense of wonder so indestructible, it would last throughout their life. So this is really the purpose of meditation more than anything. Yes, we can quiet the mind, we can calm ourselves, we can unstress, we can see in new ways. But it invites more than that, it invites a sense of wonder and mystery and with it a sense of love. When Thomas Merton was traveling in Asia, he writes in Asian Journal, he went to Anuradhapura. I'm not sure it was Anuradhapura. He went to the great monastery in Sri Lanka where an entire cliff was carved with these huge statues of the Buddha and Ananda. And he said he stood there on the grass barefoot Observing the extraordinary faces, the great smiles, huge and subtle, filled with every possibility, questioning nothing, knowing everything, rejecting nothing. The peace not of emotional resignation, 
but the stillness that is seen through every question without trying to discredit anyone, without refutation, without any argument. The thing is, when you see in this way, there's no puzzle, no problem. All the problems are resolved and clear because you see that what matters is everything is emptiness and everything is compassion. He said that was the most moving work of art he'd ever seen. To see the eyes, even out of stone of the Buddha, saying it's all empty. And it all matters. The great heart of compassion and loving awareness. Meditation, in the end, is not about gaining something or attaining something. Instead, we can see the world with the heart of wisdom. San Sanim, Sung San De San Sanim, Zen, Korean Zen master with whom I practiced, used to say at certain moments, people would ask, he's the Zen master, and this is 1970s, and everybody wanted to get enlightened. How about this, and how about that? And sometimes he would pause and look back at people and say, you already understand. It was a beautiful moment. You already understand. This is the mystery. You already know. And it was tremendously empowering to hear it. It was a reminder to us. Now, of course, the whole spiritual industry, of which I'm a card-carrying member and part of, has an entire, you know, wing of it devoted to the development of patience and loving kindness and calm and steadiness and equanimity and, you know, all of the qualities and ethics and so forth. A kind of if you develop and develop and then you get to be this magnificent being, maybe, in this lifetime or sometime. But the spiritual industry based on development, which is not a bad thing. I mean, I've done it and it's helped me in some ways. Isn't, it's not quite the real deal. Sort of it's flirting with the reality, but it's not the real deal. So here, I was in Western Massachusetts some years ago, and one of the most beloved healers a physician in that community died. And because they were part of a whole spiritual complex in Western Massachusetts of many practitioners and practices, they did the kind of things that you might do. They got the Tibetan Lama to come and chant, and they did 49 days of practice, and they did visualizations, and they, you know, bathed his body, and they did all this stuff. And then his widow, his wife wanted to know, well, what happened to him? And so she went first because the person she encountered first was the wonderful Sufi master that they'd practiced with and said, do you have any sense of what's happened to him? And the master closed his eyes and said, yes, I've been tracking him. And he's now in this Sufi heaven and he described this place you know, with the saints, he was such a saintly soul. And she was really kind of consoled by it and helped. And then she ran into the Tibetan Lama who helped and said, I've been wondering how he's doing. And the Tibetan Lama said, oh, yeah, I've been tracking him through the bard bardo you know, and he's now in this particular bardo and this is where his consciousness is and he's moving from one to another. And she nodded and thought, hmm, that's a little different, but maybe so. <clears throat> and then a little while later in the next days, she went and spent some time with this amazing Hindu guru that they'd also practiced with. And he said, oh, I've been meditating and connecting with your husband. He's already in the womb of a woman in Washington, D.C., he's ready to take his next birth. 
And she listened and she thought to herself, whoa, here's the experts telling me all these different things. So she made a mistake and she came to visit me. And I thought, well, she's going to ask me, where is he? What do I think? You know, and even though I'm foolish, I'm maybe not that foolish, or maybe I am. But anyway, I said, I need to ask you a question. Here's the great Sufi master and the Hindu guru and the Tibetan Lama, and they're all telling you something different. And you're in this state of confusion. You don't know who to believe. What is it, I asked her, that you know that nobody could tell you anything different because you know it so deeply? What are the things you actually know? You may not know where he is, but what is the deepest knowing you have? And she began to get quiet and answer. And she said, well, the things I know that no one could tell me different. Everything changes. Everything. Everything that appears or arises eventually disappears. Everything that's born dies. It's all impermanence, all in change. I nodded, yes. What else do you know? She said, well, I've learned that if I hold on to what changes, I'll struggle. And if I let it come and go as it does, life is easier. I've also learned that I can't stop pleasure and pain, praise and blame, gain and loss. They all keep coming no matter what I try to do. I nodded yes. And she noticed a couple of other truths. She said, when I get all lost in it, I suffer a lot. When I relax and come back to my practice of mindfulness and loving kindness, it all goes easier. Take a breath. Let yourself get quiet. What do you know? No matter what the lamas and mamas and swamis and gurus and so forth might say or not, what are the things in the deepest way that you know about this human incarnation? You already understand. When I do dialogue with people, and sometimes I do at the end of these Monday classes, People ask me a question. It used to be when I was a younger teacher, I had all kinds of answers. I still do. I don't think that pleases my wife terribly much, but there they are. <clears throat> but I don't tend to answer right away. Not so much anymore. Instead, I'll say, let's breathe together. Now that question or problem you have, what makes you ask? And then all of a sudden, the whole thing will unfold because they asked me about karma. I could go on and on about karma, but instead, they'll say, well, my sister just died. Or my cousin won the lottery. You know? Or I have this good friend in Europe who's decided to go and volunteer in Ukraine. And all of a sudden, instead of an abstract question, it comes from the heart. And then I might ask, where do you feel the dilemma or the question in your body? And how do you touch it? With kindness or fear, with curiosity or trust? Not that you should, but what's actually happening? And then when they notice, they relax often. Maybe I can touch it with kindness, this question this dilemma, surprising what cool answers come back. And then I might turn to the group and say, what have others learned about this kind of dilemma or question? And all kinds of other wisdom appears. Or I might ask, 
What would your wisest self do in this circumstance? Or what would your most compassionate self do or say in this circumstance? And they get quiet and begin to trust. And it takes some practice. If you're young, you might not trust your instinct and wisdom and intuition. A job, should I get divorced or not? Sometimes the knowing will come. And sometimes it won't because it's not yet time for you to know. But in time, you will know. Take a moment to reflect. What is a big question for you in your life? And what would the wisest and most compassionate part of yourself say in response? You can know. Now, the beautiful thing is that wisdom is gracious. As it says in the Tao, if you don't remember the source, you stumble in confusion and sorrow. But when you realize where you come from, you naturally become tolerant, disinterested, amused, kind-hearted as a grandmother, dignified as a king, immersed in the wonder of the Tao, you can deal with whatever life brings you, and even when death comes, you are at ease. That's an amazing thing, to have that ease and graciousness. That's the place of wisdom. Wisdom is actually playful. Here's a story. In 1969, right out of graduate school, I was drafted into the US Army. I got new clothing, a haircut, vaccinations. I filled out a stack of forms. One asked for my religion. Feeling rebellious, I decided to choose a new religion for myself. I wrote Druid, parentheses, reformed. Two weeks later, I received my dog tag stamped with my name, social security number, blood type, and Druid reformed. I wonder how the army would administer last rites for that. Stationed stateside for several months before shipping out, I was looking forward to a big special weekend night and date when the command and commanding officer suddenly canceled all weekend, leave, in weekend leaves. A large anti-war protest was scheduled and he feared many soldiers would join in. I was determined to go out on that weekend with my girl. Discovering there was to be a full moon that weekend, I requested a two day pass to celebrate a religious holiday. The commanding officer was skeptical. What the hell religion are you? I told him I was a Druid and the last full moon before the winter solstice was our high holy day. He demanded to see my dog tags, so I showed them to him. He looked at them in stunned silence for a moment, then granted me a pass. As I was on my way out, he said, wait, wait a second, don't you guys kill goats? No, sir, I said, that's the orthodox, I'm reformed. Wisdom is playful, it is. And you know, here's the Tao saying, even in death, so, when my mother was dying, and my mother was a really loving heart, a loving being. My father was a violent, difficult figure in my life, but my mother was very loving. And she was approaching 90 and she had lost a lot of her memory. So she was in care and then hospice, but she knew who her family members were and things like that. She knew she was sort of oriented a little bit where she was. 
And in the last days, the four of us are four boys. My three brothers and I were gathered around her a couple or a few days before she died. She was there in her bed. And she had said that one of the things she was sorry about, she knew was facing death, was that human beings were going to travel to other planets. They were going to go to Mars and other places. She wished she could be around for it. So there she was lying back, kind of out of it. And my twin brother who has had, he died a few years ago. Anyway, my beloved twin, he had no shame about anything. He, he, he was a kind person, but he actually didn't care what anybody thought. He just did what he liked, which I admired greatly because I couldn't quite do it. But anyway, so she's lying there and we're gathered around this solemn thing. And he grabs her bed and he said, Mom, you know, you're getting near now. It's almost time to go to Mars. And he starts shaking her bed uh, and her head is lolling back and forth. And he said, the rocket's taking off, mom. The rocket's taking off. You're going to Mars. You're going to, she goes, oh, I am, I am. And he shook her for a while. We're all cracking up. The hospice staff, staff thinks we've just lost it, which we have actually. We couldn't stop laughing. And finally she settles back. And he says, mom, you had a trip to Mars. And she smiles a little bit, you know, that now it says, even when death comes, you can be gracious. It's not such a big deal, it turns out, in that way. You can be amused at all. And this is part of wisdom, I'm not taking it all that seriously. Now you say, wait. We're in tough times. The world is really suffering. Climate change, racism, warfare, divisiveness, you know, dangerous technologies, increasing conflict. Oh, nobly born, my friends, you humans on this planet, remember the four noble truths that suffering, the first noble truth, is not the end of the story. There is suffering and it's caused by greed and hate and ignorance and fear. But there's also a path for human beings to the end of suffering. And you know it and we know it. Joanna Macy, the great and wise systems theorist and wonderful Buddhist, Buddhist teacher, talks about this time as what she calls the great turning, a name for the most essential adventure of human beings for a very long time, the shift from industrial growth society to a life-sustaining civilization. The ecological social crises we face are caused by an economic system depending on accelerating growth, its performance measured by how fast materials can be extracted from the earth and turned into consumer, consumer products weapons and waste increasingly. A revolution is underway. People are realizing that our needs can be met without destroying the world. We have the technical knowledge, the communication tools, and the material resources to grow enough food, ensure clean air and water, and meet rational energy needs. Future generations We'll look back at the epical transition we are making to a life-sustaining society. And they may well call this the time of the great turning. You are invited to be a part of it, even now. That's one of the most hopeful things you can imagine, that we're being pushed, you know how we human beings are, we're being pushed and pressured and pressed into realizing our interdependence, into realizing that we can't continue to live the way we have and that there has to be a different consciousness. And part of your task as the wise one is not to get lost in despair or fear, although those arise, 
But as Howard Zinn writes, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It's based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, so many of them, where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and the possibility, the moral possibility of sending this world in a new and extraordinary direction. Your wisdom heart knows that we belong to each other. That sense of separation is a fiction. As Archbishop Tutu said, in Africa, when you ask someone, how are you? The reply is almost always in the plural. Even if you're speaking to one person, a man would say, we are well, or we are not well. He himself might be quite well, but his grandmother is not well. And so he is not well either. The solitary, isolated human being is really a fiction. We know this so deeply in ourselves with every breath. When Sansan Bhim said, you already understand, you do. My daughter, when she was in third or fourth grade, lettered for me this page. It's a paragraph from Chief Seattle in her elementary school handwriting, which I cherish. What is man without the beasts? If all the beasts were gone, men would die from great loneliness of spirit. For whatever happens to the beasts also happens to man. We could say women, humans. She gave it to me, said, here, daddy, I think you can use this in your talk. <laughs> and I cherish it. But we know this. We know with every breath. We know that in lots of cultures, people greet each other as relatives. Yes, there is Grandpa Joe, our president, right? and grandmother Kamala, and that weird uncle Donald, you know, they're all members of our family, all of them. Sisters and brothers, aunties, we know this. But, but we also forget, and this is part of the mystery just as there's remembering, there's forgetting, the illusion of forgetting. And our culture does really good at it. Modern consumer culture is an inoculation against the misery. Get things, buy things, have a new future, all of this. John Gatto, the New York City Teacher of the Year, wrote, think of the things that are killing us as a nation drugs, brainless competition, recreational sex, the pornography of violence, gambling, alcohol, and the worst pornography of all, lives devoted to buying things. We tune out, we forget who we are, we forget the mystery, we forget the capacity of the heart, we get lost. Hmm. Thinking about which stories to read or tell. All right, I'll read this one anyway. You've heard it. John invited his mother over for dinner. During the meal, his mother couldn't help notice how beautiful John's roommate was. She'd been long suspicious of a 
relationship between John and his roommate. And she got more curious. And watching the two, her son, John, volunteered at some point. I know what you might be thinking, Mom, but I assure you that Carrie and I are just roommates. A week later, Carrie came to John and said, ever since your mother came to dinner, I've been able, unable to find that beautiful silver gravy ladle we did when we made that nice dinner for her. You don't suppose she did something with it, do you? He said, well, I'll, I'll write her an email. Dear mother, I'm not saying you did take the gravy ladle or move it somehow or didn't, but the, somehow mysteriously it's been missing ever since you were here for dinner. She get sent a message back, which read, dear son, I'm not saying you do sleep with Carrie, and I'm not saying you don't, but the fact remains that if she was sleeping in her own bed, she would have found the gravy ladle by now. Love your mother. It's entitled, don't lie to your mother. Don't lie to yourself. You know, Ruth Dennison was asked if she could explain karma. And she said, karma means you don't get away with nothing. Because there's always somebody watching and you know who that is. As Miss Piggy would say, moi. We're the ones that see and know. But with loving awareness, with the very practice at the heart of what we do of mindfulness and loving awareness, we also discover we know that awareness is big enough to hold it all. The 10,000 tears and joys and sorrows that the heart is big enough to hold it all. And that the purpose of meditation isn't some grim duty to make yourself somehow a better person. I know you've got your therapy, you go to the gym, you work out, all that, but it's not really about that. Yeah. It's about the presence of the loving heart and the wisdom that opens to this mystery and how we navigate it and you already understand. When my teacher Ajahn Chah went to visit the most famous master of his time, another Ajahn, Ajahn Man, I've told this story so many times, and he described all the experiences of his meditations, wanting to get guidance, dissolving himself into light and having bliss and you know, seeing the suffering of the world and all the things one can see. And Ajahn Man said, well, that's good enough, Cha, but you've missed the point. Ajahn Cha said, what do you mean? He said, well, those are just experiences. They're like movies on a screen. You know, there's a romantic comedy and a war movie and a, you know, a documentary and so forth. All those experiences come and go. The only question is, to whom do they happen? Turn your attention back to awareness itself and become the one who knows, become the knowing. Ramdas describes this as, I am loving awareness. That's his phrase, I am loving awareness. When you shift from the experience to become the mindful, loving awareness itself. And because the two are wedded together, well, here's a poem from Zen master Isa, great haiku poet, and one of Japan's most beloved poets of all time. He writes, dew evaporates and all our world is dew. So dear, so refreshing, so fleeting. And I'll recite it again now with context. He wrote this poem when his young daughter died and he loved her and he said, dew evaporates and all our life is due. 
so dear, so refreshing, and so fleeting. Suzuki Roshi said, when you realize the fact that everything changes, when you realize the fact that everything changes and find your composure in the midst of them, there you find yourself in nirvana. So the wise heart is filled with tenderness and compassion like Isa. And it views the world, birth and death, joy and sorrow, so much of it, with kindly eyes. Take a pause for a moment and ask yourself what's asked to be viewed with kindly eyes in your life and in this world. And when you quiet and listen, you know, you already understand. So, central casting has put you in this particular weird body that you have, in the weird family and weird culture in which you were born. What an amazing thing for this ride, you know, this hide and seek that Thich Nhat Hanh described. Central casting put you there and put all the characters around you so you would have a really rich human experience, right? With the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows and with a trillion creatures living in your body. You're a galaxy for all these little viruses and bacteria and amazing things that live inside you. And gain and loss and pleasure and pain. Here you are, you get the whole drama. Central Casting says, here, try this life. See what it's like. Yeah. And then you think, well, I want it just to be pure and beautiful. Ha 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 ha. Alex Solzhenitsyn and I think of him because he was in the gulag where Navalny was just killed. And he was one of the great, great Russian poets and authors who also got thrown into the Siberian prisons. And yet from there he wrote, if only it were so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who among us is willing to destroy a piece of our own heart? So here you are asking, that deep question, you know, what needs to be seen with kindly eyes, even the horrible and the terrible? Or maybe it's your own aging, you know, if you look at your body and go, whoa, because I've been talking to my colleagues and friends, we're all headed toward 80. In a couple of few months, my beloved Dharma teacher partner, Joseph Goldstein turns 80. John Kevitzin turns 80. Trudy and I turn 79. Hmm, something's happening here. And as Thich Nhat Hanh, well, I think more of the retreats I used to teach with Stephen Levine, dear friend, and a wise person who wrote a lot about these subjects you know, healing into life and death and who dies and so forth. We'd be teaching together and people would talk about what they've been through and what they're going through. And he would pause, he would look with such kindness and he'd say, 
Big surprise. Big surprise. Oh, there's death happening. Big surprise. There's birth happening. Big surprise. There's gain and loss and pleasure and pain. All of it. And as you get quiet, and as you listen to what you really know, there comes a kind of trust. A trust in your intuition. It's the intuition. Ruth Dennison, colleague and Dharma teacher who died a few years ago, she had a ticket to get on one of those airplanes on 9-11, the one that crashed into the field and was going to go crash into the Pentagon, crashed in Pennsylvania. She was going toward the gate and she said, uh-uh, I don't think I should get on this plane. Something in you knows often if you quiet and listen, if you learn to trust that you can see deeply, that you can live from a place of understanding. And trust, it turns out, in the great Zen texts, trust is really another word for liberation. Liberation, it says, is one with a trusting heart. To trust that the heart is big enough to hold it all, that you can navigate it all, birth and death when it comes. Mary Oliver explains it this way. To live in this life, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal. To hold it against your bones as if your life depends upon it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Three lines of wisdom to love and to let go. And this whole world is like a star at dawn, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, an echo or a rainbow, a dance, a dream. What happened to your childhood? Terrible, beautiful, whatever it was. Hey, baby, it's back with the pyramids and the dinosaurs, it's back into the void and a new day appears. As Maya Angelou says, it's a wonderful day. I've never seen this one before. It keeps coming back. And it's not that happiness makes us grateful, but that the wisdom part and its gratitude makes us happy. And this is what we really know. The path to happiness is not one of possession. Socrates used to love to go to the markets, he said, and see all the things that he was happy not having. He just enjoyed the dance of it all. This is wise understanding. The path to happiness is that you can't possess anything, even your own body. What you are is free to love it. You can love. And living, you can live as a wise being, just where you are. It's never too late. Oh, nobly born. And then you become grateful for it all. I mean, what an amazing thing to have this life. And what an invitation of awakening, O oh, nobly born. Remember that there's a freedom in you, a humor and a perspective and a vast love that no one can take from you. It's who you really are. I remember teaching with Stephen Levine, really loved him. And we had many good years of friendship. And sometimes toward the end of his retreats, especially 
Yeah, he was dealing with people who had loss and just struggling in different ways in life. And he would say, if you only had one more day to live, who would you call? And what would you say? And why are you waiting? So we come together to quiet the mind, to open the heart, to remember that you are the Buddha, you are the wise one, you already understand to trust this, to live in the vast love and spacious awareness. That's who you really are.